Good evening and welcome to Metro Focus. I'm Jack Ford. Is Donald Trump the most litigious president in U.S. history? Well, a new book suggests that not only is the answer a resounding yes, but that over his lifetime, Donald Trump has learned to weaponize the legal system to his advantage and has even carried the practice into the Oval Office. Plaintiff in Chief, a portrait of Donald Trump in 3,500 lawsuits, offers a comprehensive analysis of the president's legal challenges over the years, beginning with a racial discrimination suit early in his New York real estate career. It's written by Jim Zirin, a former assistant U.S. attorney for the Southern District of New York and self-described Republican, who makes the case that everything you need to know about Donald Trump, you can learn from the way he's used, some would say abused, the legal system for well over three decades. So. Here to discuss the plaintiff-in-chief and the president's temperament and presidential philosophy is attorney, author, and talk show host, Jim Zirin. Jim, it's nice to have you here Nice with to us. be here, Jack. Nice to be here with you. But let's start with the big picture. And you, you say in this that litigation is the key to understanding Donald Trump. What do you mean by that? Well, we inherited the adversary system from the English. And it was thought that the adversary system is the best way to arrive at the truth because uh, the competing sides would tell, uh, put forward their best arguments and tell their side of the story. Uh, Trump saw the legal system in a different kind of way. He saw it as a, a weapon uh, to destroy the adversary, not necessarily to get at the truth, perhaps even to get at a lie. But uh, the legal system could be a very potent weapon in his business arsenal, later in his public arsenal. So what drew you? You've written before um, on, on courts and court systems. But what drew you to this story and made you decide, I, this is the book I want to do now? I started uh, with a, uh, an abiding interest in Roy Cohn. Oh. It's the subject of a movie that's out in which I'm one of the talking heads right. uh, called Where's My Roy Cohn? Uh, and Cohn met Trump in 1973. I knew of Cohn from my days in the U.S. Attorney's Office, and uh, Trump met Cohn in a bar. He'd been sued by the Department of Justice and the Nixon administration for violation of the Fair Housing Act because he discriminated in housing. The case against him was overwhelming. Uh, he went to a number of reputable lawyers who said, your best course is to settle the case with the Justice Department and agree not to discriminate anymore. Uh, Cohn said, you've been misadvised, nothing doing, fight, attack, counterattack, and we'll beat them into the ground. Trump liked that advice. Mm -hmm. And so uh, he retained Cohn as his lawyer. And the first thing they did was they counterclaimed against the government for $100 million. The second thing they did was they launched an attack against the government attorneys. And they said that the government attorneys were engaging in stormtrooper-like tactics, Gestapo-like tactics in uh, the way they approached witnesses and employees of the Trump organization. Uh, the judge very quickly dismissed this counterclaim for $100 million against the government uh, and held a hearing and found that the lawyers were guilty of no misconduct whatsoever. That's all that happened in the case. And at the end of the day, Trump settled the case with the Justice Department, agreed not to discriminate anymore, and got the same result he would have gotten. Doing what uh, was suggested initially. If it had been suggested in the first place. So th this, this got you interested in it. Now, we talk about, it, and, it's, and it's a, it looks like a, a, a uh, mileage meter in a car yes. where the numbers are rolling over. But it talks about. An odometer. An odometer. At 3,500, see, you went to Princeton, I went to Yale. <laughs> like, it came to you quickly, it didn't come to well, me. Well, maybe the, at <laughs> Yale they adjusted the odometer. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but it talks about some 3,500 lawsuits. Now, people might look at that and say, oh, okay, is, is that sort of apocryphal, or are we really talking about that many lawsuits? What's the answer to that? Well, of course, I didn't count them myself, right. but uh, USA Today mm -hmm. uh, used the 3,500 figure, mm -hmm. and it was corroborated by the American Bar Association, which used the 4,000 figure. Right. Uh, it's properly thought that uh, Trump had more lawsuits than the top three real estate developers in the United States combined. And uh, so I thought 3,500 was probably a safer figure than 4,000. I went with 3,500. I was more interested in the types of litigation. Yeah, talk, talk about that he a little was bit. What, what sort of type? Because the, he, again, the book is it's it's a, a it's a compelling read, and you know you don't try to catalog each and every case, obviously, but you do talk about different categories. So, what sort of categories did you find that that were most interesting to you? 
Well, of course, uh, Trump brought slightly more suits than cases where he was on the receiving end, although he was on the receiving end of a lot of different kinds of suits. He had suits with all of his partners. Uh, he would sue them uh, under RICO. He would sue them for a billion dollars. Uh, he would try to get money These from them. These are his them. partners. These are his partners. So you had the Pritzkers. Right. You had Conseco, who was his partner in the GM building in New York. You had his Chinese partners on the West Side Yards. Uh, one of his Hong Kong partners uh, said, you've got to understand Donald Trump. Uh, he likes litigation for lunch. Uh, all these cases uh, were dismissed unfavorably to Trump. And um, so those were the suits with partners. He was sued by the government for money laundering in Atlantic City. He was sued by taxing authorities. Uh, he was sued by the uh, county of Palm Beach for an 80-foot uh, high flagpole in front of his estate at Mar-a-Lago. Uh, there were silly suits. There were spite suits. He sued a critic for the Chicago Tribune uh, who said one of his projects uh, would be an eyesore on the skyline. Uh, that case was dismissed. Uh, the one that, uh, that I always uh, enjoy recounting is uh, that uh, Trump uh, apparently uh, got wind of the fact that in Baldwin, Long Island, uh, there were uh, two people, a father and a daughter who owned a travel agency called Trump Travel and Tours. Uh, now, it was called Trump Travel and Tours because they booked bridge tours for people, mm -hmm. and also because Trump is like ace hardware. It signified excellence. Okay. Trump had never been in the travel business. He'd never been in business in Baldwin, um, Long Island. He'd never been in business in Long Island. But he got wind of this, and he sued them for using the Trump name. Mm. And they exhausted their life savings defending the suit. Uh, the daughter said, uh, you know, why would I want to use the name Trump anyway? He's a misogynist and a racist, uh, and I don't know that it helps our business. But they stuck to their guns. At the end of the day, there was a settlement where they agreed to reduce the size of the sign uh, Trump Travel. Right, to get that done. And that was the disposition. I, I would suspect that it either... President Trump himself or his allies and supporters would take a look at, at the book and say, well, you know what? This is just another illustration of him utilizing the laws uh, in, a, in a way that maybe was more creative than other people. Um, he, he, he saw an area where he could gain an advantage by using the laws. We've heard the president himself when he was asked about his, his, uh, the variety of bankruptcies involving his companies, and he said, I use the laws that existed there. Um, I didn't make this up. The laws were there. So I suspect that his supporters would look at this and say, look, this is just a matter of him, maybe more so than anybody else, but using the laws to his own personal advantage. What, what would your answer be to that? Well, of course, he lost most of the cases, so uh, the law was not on his side, and he was not claiming the benefit of the law. He was really relying on the American system of justice, where each side bears his or her own legal fees. As under the English like system, the British, as opposed to the British system, where loser pays. Loser pays. So uh, someone would, like the couple in, uh, in Baldwin, Long Island, were bankrupted uh, defending this case that Donald Trump brought. Now, why did he bring the case? Did he bring the case because these people were costing him money, because uh, he was legitimately aggrieved? No, he the brought the case out of pique and spite. And um, that's a misuse of the legal system. I mean, let, last question for you. Again, there's, there's so much in this book that, that people who are interested in this or, should read, and they'll, they'll find it compelling, whether they agree or not. But last question for you, and taking it into today and, and what's going on with the impeachment inquiry. You, you talk about how Roy Cohn's lasting message to Donald Trump is, is you never apologize, um, you don't surrender, you don't settle, you always attack. Are you seeing evidence of that advice from Roy Cohn playing out today in terms of the president and his allies in the impeachment inquiry? The answer, of course, is yes. Uh, the other um, uh, canon of Roy Cohn was no matter what happens, always claim victory and go home. And uh, so when uh, Trump has a conversation with the president of Ukraine in which he's clearly uh, extorting him and pressuring him, to uh, investigate Joe Biden and uh, threatening to withhold aid as the quid pro quo unless he does, and this has been corroborated by at least six people in the position to know, one of whom recently changed his testimony. But uh, Trump engages 
and has historically engaged in asymmetrical warfare, where you don't really meet uh, the charge that's made against you, but you attack the accuser. And that's exactly what he's done in the uh, Ukraine investigation. Uh, he has attacked the whistleblower because he didn't have firsthand knowledge. Whistleblowers sometimes don't have firsthand knowledge. And uh, that's, uh, secondly, the whistleblower was corroborated. And thirdly, there's no issue whatsoever about what the whistleblower said, but still he wants the whistleblower's identity to be revealed. He wants to torture the whistleblower who committed treason. He's out to find spies. Roy Cohn was out to find spies. Uh, Roy Cohn was uh, one of the prosecutors of the Rosenbergs. When Trump says that Adam Schiff intimates that Adam Schiff should be executed for treason, I mean, this is right out of the Roy Cohn playbook. And uh, we see this resonating again and again in Trump's behavior. So I, I guess this is really the last question I should ask you, which is, given what you say in the book and what you've said, are you at all worried that you could become lawsuit number 3,501? I'm frequently asked that question, and I hope I am, because it'll be, do wonders for the sale of the book. Uh, Michael Wolff's book, uh, Fire and Fury, probably would have sold about 3,000 copies. It sold a million after Trump uh, threatened to sue him. Well, it'll be interesting. Jim, it's always a pleasure to talk with you. Thank you for spending so much time with us. We appreciate it. Well, thank you very much. You'd be welcome. A pleasure.